Chapters 15 and 16 Summary and Analysis Summary One week has gone by, and Nellie finds the time to continue relating her story to Lockwood. Four days after her visit to Isabella, Nellie has the opportunity, while Edgar is in church, to give Catherine Heathcliff's letter. She presses the letter into the apathetic woman's hand, but Catherine is too depressed to even notice it is from Heathcliff and does not react until he enters the room. Catherine kisses Heathcliff, and he returns it with, quote, more kisses than he ever gave in his life before, unquote. Looking into her face, he realizes that she is close to death, and in anguish they cling to each other with such intense passion that they make, quote, a strange and fearful picture, unquote. Catherine accuses him of joining with Edgar in having broken her heart and claims he will forget her after she dies to find happiness elsewhere. He is distraught at her words, and she asks his forgiveness. Catherine tells Nellie not to feel sorrow for her impending death, rather to envy her, for she regards death as a release from her earthly prison. Heathcliff asks Catherine if she is possessed by the devil to talk so sanguinely of her death. He begs her not to torture him after she dies, thus driving him as mad as she is now. Suddenly, Nellie observes Edgar returning from church and implores Heathcliff to leave her at once, but Catherine will not release him from her arms. Aware that she will soon die, and it is the last time she will ever hold her beloved soulmate, she cries out that Edgar will not harm them. As Edgar approaches, he resigns himself to the possibility of death, so that he and Catherine can be together. Catherine faints. Seeing them together, Edgar rushes to attack, but Heathcliff hands him Catherine's limp body and begs him to take care of her first before they speak. Heathcliff goes to the garden to wait. At midnight, Catherine gives birth to her daughter, Cathy, and two hours later, she is dead. Nellie tries to think how to break the news to Heathcliff, but he already knows. Moved to pity, Nellie assures him that in death, Catherine appears to be at peace. Maddened, Heathcliff prays that Catherine's soul know no rest until he himself is dead. Quote, be with me always, unquote, he begs. Quote, take any form, drive me mad, I cannot live without my soul, unquote. Edgar sits with Catherine's coffin until the funeral, while Heathcliff holds vigil in the garden below. When Edgar leaves her side for a few hours' rest, Nellie beckons Heathcliff in to allow him to say goodbye. Heathcliff unclasps the locket she has around her neck, removes its contents, undoubtedly Edgar's hair, and replaces them with a lock of his own. Hindley fails to appear at his sister's funeral, and Isabella is not invited. Catherine is not buried in the family vault, but on a lovely green hill by the moors. Nellie tells Lockwood that Edgar lies in the same spot now. Discussion and Analysis The reader now understands Heathcliff's despair in Chapter 3 that Lockwood, rather than he, discovered Catherine's ghost. We now realise that her spirit has obeyed his pleas to have no rest until he too is dead. Heathcliff's desire to be haunted by her is thwarted by knowing her ghost is searching for him and cannot find him. We are also aware that one aspect of Heathcliff's revenge will now come true. Since Catherine and Edgar's baby is a girl, contemporary English inheritance laws allowed for the Linton property to pass to Isabella at the time of Edgar's death. This means that as her husband, Heathcliff will control Edgar's estate, a horrifying thought which will trouble Edgar for the remainder of his life. Heathcliff's astonishing hostility for Cathy in the early chapters now begins to make some sense. Since Catherine died giving birth to the girl, it is likely that Heathcliff associates her existence with the loss of Catherine. We have yet to learn how Cathy came to be Heathcliff's daughter-in-law, since Heathcliff has no son, a mystery which future chapters will answer. Chapter 17 Summary and Analysis Summary Immediately following Catherine's funeral, 
the pleasant weather becomes cold and dismally chilly, setting the tone for Edgar's grief, Cathy's motherless state, and Isabella's rebellion. Sitting alone with baby Cathy, Nellie hears an intruder and is amazed to discover Isabella dripping wet, bruised and exhausted. Isabella insists on having a carriage take her to town and a few of her former belongings packed before she will consent to let Nellie tend to her woe-begone condition. Once Nellie does as she asks, Isabella sits by the fire to explain her escape, requesting that Nellie put the baby away. She, quote, doesn't like to see it, unquote. Isabella flings her wedding ring into the fire, daring Heathcliff to search for her simply as a way to antagonize Edgar. Proudly, she refuses to ask Edgar for any help, since he has not been kind to her since her defection. Babbling and somewhat hysterical, she utters her regret that Hindley is in no condition to kill Heathcliff for both their sakes. That, she says, would have been worth remaining behind to witness. Indeed, Isabella claims she should and wishes she could stay at the Grange to help Edgar raise Cathy, but knows Heathcliff would not allow her. Acknowledging that he detests her, Isabella knows that Heathcliff would rather endure her presence than allow her and Edgar to be content. Rid of her depressed desire to die at Heathcliff's hands, Isabella now only wishes he would kill himself since he is a monster. She wonders how Catherine, knowing his true nature, could have loved him, and concludes that she must have had, quote, an awfully perverted taste, unquote. When Nellie protests that she should be more charitable to Heathcliff since he is a human being, Isabella flatly denies his humanity. The return of her instinct for self-preservation is due to her pleasure in learning how to antagonize him, and now that she is free, if she ever sees him again, she swears her revenge on him. The narration switches here to Isabella, who regales Nellie with the events precipitating her escape. Hindley, too drunk to attend the funeral, sits in the kitchen with Isabella, taking advantage of Heathcliff's pre-funeral vigil at the Grange. When Heathcliff is heard outdoors, Hindley tells Isabella that if they were both not cowards, they should punish Heathcliff for what he has done to each of them, and thus end their misery. Isabella wants nothing more than to be free, but objects to using treachery and violence, which, quote, wound those who resort to them worse than their enemies, unquote. Hindi retorts that Heathcliff deserves to be treated with treacherous violence, since that is how he deals with everyone, and if she will allow him, he would turn it on the, quote, hellish villain, unquote, himself. As Hindley prepares to shoot, Isabella warns Heathcliff, but he merely curses, while Hindley swears at her for interfering. Heathcliff warns Isabella to let him in, or he'll make her regret it, but she refuses, saying Hindley is waiting by the door with a gun and a knife. She advises him to go to Catherine's grave and die alongside, quote, the whole joy of your life, unquote. At this, Heathcliff breaks through a window and disarms Hindley, catching the knife in Hindley's flesh. With his blood still dripping, Heathcliff pockets the knife and pounds Hindley's head into the stone floor, stopping only at Joseph's threat to send for Edgar, who is village magistrate. In the morning, Isabella notices that Hindley was too drunk to recall the details of the previous evening's violence. Hindley sorrowfully wishes for the strength to kill Heathcliff, but Isabella says it is bad enough that Heathcliff has caused Catherine's death, and recalls how happy she and Catherine both were before he returned. Hearing her, Heathcliff sobs, and Isabella laughs at him. Attacking her with a knife, she dodges and throws one back at him. Lunging for her, Hindley manages to block him, and so she escapes, knocking over Hareton, who is hanging a litter of puppies. Having completed her tale, Isabella departs. Nellie resumes the narration, informing Lockwood that Isabella had moved near London and given birth to a son, Linton. Heathcliff doesn't follow her, but keeps himself apprised of his son from afar. When Linton is twelve, Isabella dies. Meanwhile, Edgar avoids the sight of Heathcliff and is gratified to learn that Isabella has left him. Although he still mourns his wife, he takes consolation in his young daughter, Cathy. Nellie compares Edgar's gracious reaction to adversity with Hindley's, pondering how the two men 
both gentlemen by birth, deviated in their behaviour. Despite Edgar's weakness as a boy, Nelly observes that he has matured into the stronger man. Six months after Catherine's death, Mr. Kenneth arrives to tell Nelly of Hindley's demise. Nelly weeps for the loss of her childhood friend and pleads with Edgar to be allowed to organise his funeral. Furthermore, she reminds Edgar of his moral obligation to Hareton, who, as Catherine's nephew, has no other family. Edgar agrees to let Nelly bring Hareton to the Grange to live. Discussing Hindley's affairs with his attorney, Nelly learns that Hareton is penniless. All of Hindley's estate has been heavily mortgaged to Heathcliff. He grudgingly permits her to give Hindley a decent burial at his expense, but surprises her by refusing to relinquish Hareton to Edgar's guardianship. Caressing the child roughly, he tells Nelly that raising a child might be amusing, and if Edgar insists on taking Hareton, Heathcliff will take Linton away from Isabella. Halted by this threat, Edgar does not press further. As a result, Hareton, who by birthright ought to be the neighbourhood squire, is completely dependent on his father's enemy, impoverished and friendless, and most sadly, unaware of the injustice done him. Discussion and Analysis This chapter is filled with harrowing details about domestic life at the Heights, even worse than what Lockwood experienced at the start of the novel. There seems to be no limit to the torture and degradation Heathcliff delights in heaping on Hindley and Isabella. Hindley is extraordinarily pathetic in his inebriated, futile attempts to kill Heathcliff, yet he touches Isabella with the suggestion of his former gentlemanly self when he speaks to her. Nowhere can we recognise the angrily authoritative young man he was, so thoroughly has Heathcliff orchestrated his ruin. The change in Isabella is evident in this chapter. No longer a foolish romantic, Isabella has seen far too much to remain innocent. She rallies her internal strength. Rather than allow Heathcliff to ruin her, as he has Hindley, she learns to fight back. It may be difficult to understand why she warns Heathcliff of Hindley's trap, since she knows his death will benefit everyone. We can interpret her refusal to engage in vengeance and treachery as a manifestation of her true nature. She was raised to be a Christian gentlewoman, not an avenger. Remaining true to her upbringing is a sign of her emotional recovery from her ordeal. To Isabella, Nellie has the opportunity while Edgar is in church to give Catherine Heathcliff's letter. She presses the letter into the apathetic woman's hand, but Catherine is too depressed to even notice it is from Heathcliff and does not react until he enters the room. ...that they make, quote, a strange and fearful picture, unquote. Catherine accuses him of joining with Edgar in having broken her heart and claims he will forget her after she dies to find happiness elsewhere. He has distraught at her words. Chapters 15 and 16, Summary and Analysis Summary One week has gone by, and Nelly finds the time to continue relating her story to Lockwood. Four days after her visit, Catherine kisses Heathcliff, and he returns it with, quote, more kisses than he ever gave in his life before, unquote. Looking into her face, he realises that she is close to death, and in anguish they cling to each other with such intense passions, and she asks his forgiveness. Catherine tells Nelly not to feel sorrow for her impending death, rather to envy her, for she regards death as a release from her earthly prison. Heathcliff asks Catherine if she is possessed by the 